Six Steps of Philosophical Counseling. Hello, this is Dr. Bing Song at Washington College. I'm very glad you have made significant progress in understanding and perhaps practicing a little bit on yourself the method of philosophical counseling. I have to admit that I reverse the order of teaching a bit so that you can get a quick taste of what philosophical counseling looks like and what is the use of it. Therefore, in Unit Three, I told the first step of LBT to identify emotional reasoning. Now it is Unit Four. I will introduce the whole set of the LBT program. It includes six steps and many technical details. A caveat needs to be said beforehand is that although stated as a rigorous program comprising of steps and details, the application of LBT is actually very flexible. None of these steps and details are rigid rules. You need to follow 100%. Because one very important feature of counseling practice is to attend to the uniqueness of the counselees with the unique skill set of the counselors. In other words, every human being is different, and we need to continually adjust our methods and skills to tackle varying situations. However, for beginning learners and practitioners, it is always good to have a well-structured program to follow, which we will learn in this course. In the long run, however, if you want to be really good at this, you need to keep learning and practicing. Not only LBT, but also other skills you think are helpful for your practice. So, let's start to introduce the six steps of LBT. The first step has already been discussed in Unit One, and it is to identify emotional reasoning. The second step is to check for cardinal fallacies in the premises. If you open the script of Unit Three. Towards its end, we write down the long chain of emotional reasoning of the consulee. Look at the four rules we once identified. Rule four: I must have the approval of all those who matter to me. Rule three: If I don't have the approval of someone who matters to me, then I am worthless. Rule two: If I don't have the approval of my dad, then I'm worthless. And rule one: If my dad often tells me that I'm stupid, then I must be worthless. We find none of these rules is realistic or reasonable, and this is the reason we call them fallacies. There are some very frequent fallacies humans tend to commit when we are inappropriately emotional. The LBT generalizes these fallacies into three categories and eleven kinds, which is described in the Table 1.1 in the assigned reading. If you learn the details of each of these fallacies, which we will do in the following of the course, you will get to understand which one the counselee in question has committed. So, for Rule Four, he demands perfection. For rule two and three, he damns himself just because he cannot get approval from others. For rule one, he indicates a bandwagon thinking because he subdues his self-respect to the judgment of others. We find that all these fallacies are quite often interrelated with each other. If the counselee does not demand perfection, namely demand approval from all people who matter to him. He would not damn himself if he cannot get such an approval. Further, if he does not damn himself just because he cannot get approval from others, he would not subdue his self-respect to the judgment of others. And this interrelatedness of fallacies furnishes two very practical points for executing the following steps of LBT. First, if the therapist can successfully tackle one cardinal fallacy, it will be easier to tackle others. Second, as mentioned before, philosophical theories tend to be comprehensive and profound, and hence, when suggesting an uplifting philosophy to the counselee, which is step five of LBT, the therapist can take a very holistic approach. To coach the counselee in tackling the indicated fallacies altogether, and we will get to this point shortly. Step three: refuting any fallacy. Since there are fallacies, they must be refuted, as indicated in Unit Two. While refuting fallacies, philosophical counselors use all classical methods to do so. 
such as reduction to the absurd, deducing a contradiction, showing double standards, and showing insufficient evidence, etc. Let's continue to use the previous example to indicate how this proceeds in an extra therapeutic process. Counselor, let's look at your premise that you must have the approval of all those who matter to you. The word must means that this approval is necessary and cannot be the other way. Is that correct? Yes, that sounds right to me. But if this approval were necessary, then you would have always had the approval of all those who matter to you. Do you agree? Yes. But not everyone who matters to you has in fact always given you their approval. Is that correct? Yes, like my dad. So at least some people who matter to you don't have to give you their approval, otherwise they would necessarily have given it. That's right. So it cannot be possibly true that uh, you must have the approval of all those who matter to you, because this would mean that their approval was both necessary and not necessary at the same time, which is impossible. Hmm, I see exactly what you are saying. If I really had to have this approval, I would have already gotten it, but I didn't. Right, so your premise that you must have the approval of all those who matter to you makes no sense. Now, let's also take a look at your premise that if your dad tells you you are stupid, then you must be worthless. Not that you see that you don't have to have the approval of all those who matter to you. Do you still think he's telling you that you are stupid as a reason to think you are worthless? No, not really. I don't need my dad to approve of me, so I don't really need to take what he says about me so seriously. But I still feel really down when I think of him telling me I'm stupid. Here, the philosophical counselor deduces a self-contradiction from the rule 4 of the counselee's emotional reasoning and indicates his fallacy of demanding perfection, which projects his own preference of getting approval from others into reality and demands such a reality must exist. From the above conversation, we can notice several features of refutation in the step 3 of LBT. First, the conversational tone of the counselor needs to be maintained to be as respectful as possible. Refutation during the process of counseling is not for the purpose of advancing human knowledge in venues such as academic journals or conferences. Instead, it is to transform people's characters and to heal their self-defeating emotions and behaviors. Therefore, nothing in the process of philosophical therapy can surpass the skill of putting words into one's mouth, namely to help the counselee realize the problems of their own emotional reasonings by themselves. In this way, it is always a good idea for philosophers to reread Socratic dialogues and to learn how Socrates acted as a midwife to help his interlocutors hit on answers by themselves. Second, although fallacies in a chain of emotional reasonings are interconnected, it is convenient for the therapist to start from refuting the fallacy of the premise in the highest order. As indicated by the conversation, once realizing demanding perfection is a fallacy, the counselee is easier to understand why demanding approval from his father is not a sound idea as well. Third. Sometimes we actually do not quite need to refute the counselee in any formal way. For people who have common sense and ordinary intelligence, once we write down their emotional reasoning in paper, just as what we did in Unit 3, they almost immediately realize how faulty their beliefs are. So, although we write down a formal refutation conducted by the therapist here, you will find many flexible ways to do so in the actual practice. Fourth, at the end of the conversation, the counselee still feels down although intellectually, he knows he's wrong when using the rule 1 as a premise of his emotional reasoning. This is called a cognitive dissonance, namely, what people think is not congruent with what people feel or do. Obviously, more work needs to be done to help the counselee to not only think correctly, but to form a habit of feeling and acting in line with the newly recognized thought. And therefore, let's move on to the next steps. Step 4 Identifying the Guiding Virtue for Each Fallacy 
As mentioned in Unit 3, the highest premise to guide one's sometimes very long chain of emotional reasoning enjoys a higher degree of generality. It normally indicates a hardwired belief that can define a mindset, habit, or even persistent worldview. Therefore, to correct the fallacy that is indicated by such a belief, we need an ethical theory that focuses upon the transformation of people's inner disposition, habit, and character traits, and thus prioritizes the cultivation of good human beings over other ethical concerns, such as how to make good decisions in concrete situations. In the history of Western philosophy, the Aristotelian virtue ethics is such an ethical theory, and thus this fourth step of LBT is greatly inspired by the general ethical framework that Aristotle has furnished. LBT provides a guiding virtue to correct each of identified fallacies in people's emotional reasoning. If you turn to Table 1.1 in the assigned reading, you will see the whole list of fallacies and their corresponding virtues. For instance, for the fallacy of demanding perfection, we once identified above in the Rule 4 of the Consulate's emotional reasoning, he needs to cultivate a virtue of metaphysical security, that is to become more accepting of and comfortable with the imperfections of reality, particularly the incontrovertible fact that not everyone you want to like or prove of you will do so. For the fallacy of damning himself, the consulee needs to attain greater self-respect, that is again an improved sense of one's own self-worth as a human being or person. For the fallacy of bandwagon thinking, he needs to attain increased authenticity, that is, become more autonomous or self-determining, informing judgment, especially about oneself. Of course, the list of these fallacies and guiding virtues might not exhaust all the cases of self-defeating emotions and behavior. However, as we explained, human beings exist and live their life as a whole. This means that as long as we seriously dedicate ourselves to cultivating at least one virtue, we will command the correct method and form a good habit to cultivate our life as a whole. Therefore, the cultivating of virtues is a long aspirational goal for human life. It should never stop at any point, and at any point of human life, as long as we would like to do so, we will greatly benefit from it. Step 5. Find an uplifting philosophy that promotes the guiding virtue. If steps 1 to 4 are counted as the part of a diagnosis of LBT, steps 5 and 6 are its prescription. We believe the transformation of human characters starts from the chains of human mind and ends with the chains of human behavior. So in step 5, philosophical counselors would suggest an uplifting philosophy that can promote the identified guiding virtue so as to change the habit of thought for people seeking to change their emotional and behavioral patterns. While doing so, philosophical counseling takes a very pluralistic, inclusive, and pragmatist approach to suggest uplifting philosophies. The conversation usually starts from clarifying what pre-existing philosophical, religious, or spiritual orientation that a counselee has. And on basis of this orientation, the philosophical counselor would suggest a philosophy, which means assigning a reading or a related movie, novel, poem, music as an antidote to correct the counselee's fallacious thinking, promote the guided virtue, and help to form the right habit of thought. In other words, philosophical counselors do not seek to proselytize any of their own philosophical views during their practices. Rather, they would utilize the professional training they get about the entire human history of philosophy to suggest a philosophy fit for the counselee. For instance, to promote the virtue of authenticity to a religious person, the philosopher may suggest to read Thomas Aquinas' work so as to help the counselee to cultivate virtues for being more godlike, more sanctified. But for a person who does not believe in any idea of God, the philosopher can suggest Jean Paul Sartre's existentialism, whose ethical commitment to the freedom and independent thought of human beings is not premised upon any religious belief. 
There could also be the case that the consignee does not have any clear pre-existing philosophical orientation, and in this case, the philosophical counselor can freely exchange ideas with them and suggest ideas they feel right. To continue our previous example, we can imagine a conversation as follows and use Kant's theory of autonomy as an antidote to correct the consulist's fallacious thinking on damning himself and to promote the guided virtue of self-respect. Counselor, let's take another look at your premise that says that if you don't get the approval of those who matter to you, such as your dad, then you are worthless. You said that you still feel uncomfortable about this premise, even though you know that it is not reasonable. Consider, yes, when I even think about him calling me stupid, I start to question my self-worth. So let's see if we can help you to overcome this tendency and to attain what some counselors call unconditional self-respect. This involves accepting yourself even if others put you down. And even if, as we all do, you make mistakes, but if I accept myself unconditionally, as you say, doesn't that mean I have to be perfect? No, not at all. You can make mistakes, but that does not mean you are a mistake. You can do stupid things, but that does not make Earth stupid. I think I see what you are saying. Even very smart people make mistakes. That's right, and you are just as worthy as a person, even if others try to put you down. That's really what I have to work on, right? There is a philosopher who might be able to give you some help here. His name is Immanuel Kant, an 18th-century German philosopher who held that the worth and dignity of human beings does not depend upon whether they get the approval of others or serve useful purposes. Or whether or not they messed up, for him their worth is unconditional. Human beings, he said, are not like objects that we manipulate and use for certain purposes and discard when we have no more use for them or when we no longer like them. Instead, human beings are persons. This means that they can think things through rationally and make choices for themselves. That's a far cry from merely being some hunk of inert matter. Even if I screw up badly, I'm still a person with worth. That's right, because you can learn from your mistakes and make decisions to do things differently next time. That's exactly what it means, according to Kant, to have worth and dignity. I see. So I don't need the approval of anyone to have this power to think and make choices. I can still have worth and dignity even without the approval of my dad or anyone else. That's right. You've got it right on. At this moment, since the consulee accepts the Kant's argument as a powerful antidote to his fallacious thinking of damning himself, the philosophical counselor can assign a piece of Immanuel Kant's original writing, a short essay of popular philosophy, which recapitulates Kant's view in a more accessible way, or even some movie or novel that best manifests Kant's ideas. The thrust of this step of LBT is to provide a system of ideas supported by a philosophical argument to reframe the consulee's mind. We call this step as the philosophical bibliotherapy. For all students who have signed up in this course, if you have understood this concept of philosophical bibliotherapy, let me remind you that this concept can become a very solid guidance. For all your philosophical learning down the road, taking what you have learned about philosophical counseling into your heart, you can take time to build your own philosophical library, so that whenever a bibliotherapy is needed, you can quickly identify the philosophy that is needed and suggest the right reading for yourself or your future prospective counselees. This means everything you learn about philosophy and religion in your college. We all have a very practical consequence to bear out in the future. Step six: Applying the philosophy. As stated above, the transformation of human characters starts from the reframing of human mind and ends with changed human behaviors. Therefore, the last step of LBT is to identify the behavioral reasoning and implementing a plan of action to eventually change human behaviors. Since this step is the final and also ultimate step 
of the entire program of LBT. We will use another unit to explain it in details. Good. Let's recapitulate all the six steps of LBT. First, identify the emotional reasoning. Two, check for cardinal fallacies in the premises. Third, refute any cardinal fallacy. Four, identify the guiding virtue for each fallacy. Five, find an uplifting philosophy that promotes the guiding virtue. Six, apply the philosophy by implementing a plan of action.